Besides the heart, the other part of the cardiovascular system is the blood vessels, and there are three major types of blood vessels. The arteries carry blood away from the heart. They're going to branch to smaller arteries known as arterioles. The arterioles will feed the capillaries, the second type of blood vessel. The capillaries will be the site of exchange between the blood and the tissues, oxygen, carbon dioxide, nutrients, and waste products. Our third type of blood vessel is the veins. The capillaries will merge to make venules, and the venules will merge to form veins. The veins will return blood to the heart. Blood vessels have three layers to their walls, or three tunics. The lumen of the blood vessel is the central opening. This is where the blood will flow. The inner lining of the blood vessel is the tunica intima. This is an endothelium. Just like we had the endocardium, its function is to reduce friction. The tunica media is the middle layer. This is smooth muscle and some elastic tissue. The smooth muscle is arranged circularly around the lumen. This helps control the diameter of the lumen. And the tunica externa or tunica adventitia is the outer layer. This is a loose network of connective tissue that helps protect the blood vessel and anchors the blood vessel to surrounding tissue. The smooth muscle of the tunica media is controlled by the autonomic nervous system, specifically the sympathetic nervous system. This muscle can either contract or relax. Now most of the time the muscle is slightly contracted, not fully contracted, just slightly contracted. If the sympathetic nervous system tells it to contract more fully, then we have something happen called vasoconstriction. The lumen narrows. Less blood will flow through this blood vessel. If we stop sending any signal to the muscle, then it will relax. This causes vasodilation. The lumen opens up and maximum blood flow occurs in this blood vessel. As we look at the blood vessels, arteries have all three tunics. They have a tunica intima, they have a tunica media that is very thick. This is where we're going to see a lot of the elastic sheets. And it has a tunica adventitia. The capillaries only have a tunica intima. Since this is where the exchange between the blood and the tissues is going to occur, we don't want a lot of tissue separating the blood from the tissues. And then the veins also have all three layers. They have a tunica intima, they have a tunica media, but it's relatively thin, and they have a tunica adventitia. Now in the veins, we also have valves. Veins are going to return blood to the heart. Your heart is fairly high up in your body, which means that most of the time the blood is fighting gravity to try to get back to your heart. So there are valves in the veins to prevent backflow in the venous system. So here you see an artery blood moving away from the heart, the single layer of cells that makes up the tunica intima, the relatively thick muscular layer, the tunica media, and then the tunica adventitia. This is going to be the protective and anchoring layer. The arteries feed into arterioles, which feed the capillaries, and the capillaries only have a tunica intima. The capillaries feed into venules, which feed into the veins, and the veins are going to return blood to the heart. Here again, we see a tunica intima. Notice that the tunica media is much thinner, and we still have a tunica adventitia for anchoring and protection. Also in the veins, we have the valves to prevent backflow. The circulatory system is a closed transport system. Arteries take blood away from the heart. They branch to arterioles, and the arterioles feed the capillary beds. The capillaries are the site of nutrient, waste, and gas exchange. These will converge to form venules, the venules will converge to form veins, and the veins will return blood to the heart. In the circulatory system, the heart acts as a double pump. Both sides act in unison, that is, the left side and the right side pump simultaneously. The pulmonary circulation is the circulation from the heart to the lungs. The right side pumps unoxygenated blood to the lungs so that the gas exchange can occur. The systemic circulation is the circulation of blood to the body. The left side pumps oxygenated blood to the body tissues. So as we look at the closed system, unoxygenated blood from the tissues returns to the right atrium and will be pumped by the right ventricle into the pulmonary trunk and the pulmonary arteries. This blood is unoxygenated and this blood in the pulmonary artery is unoxygenated. It goes to the lungs, we get the gas exchange, and oxygenated blood returns to the heart in the pulmonary veins. So get over the idea that arteries contain oxygenated blood and veins unoxygenated blood because it doesn't work here. But arteries always carry blood away from the heart, veins always carry blood toward the heart. So the pulmonary artery away from the heart to the lungs, pulmonary veins back to the heart, 
from the lungs. And the pulmonary veins come into the left side of the heart, the left atrium and then the left ventricle, and that's going to pump to the body through the aorta. We will break down into the capillary beds that will nourish all of the tissues of the body. These will all merge back to become either the inferior or the superior vena cava, and we start over. So the pulmonary circuit is what the right side pumps to, pumps to the lungs. The left pump pumps the systemic circuit. It pumps to the body. The capillary beds make up what we call our microcirculation. This is going to feed the individual cells. Capillary beds are actually an interweaving of capillaries. There is a terminal arteriole that leads into what's called a met arteriole. The met arteriole is really a vascular shunt. It connects the arteriole to the venule. The true capillaries, 10 to 100 of them, branch from this vascular shunt. Blood flow into the true capillaries is controlled by precapillary sphincter muscles. This is what regulates how much blood flows to the tissues, and blood flows to the tissues based on tissue need. The capillary beds will supply oxygen and nutrients to the tissue and remove carbon dioxide and waste from the tissue. So here we have the arteriole, and here is that thoroughfare capillary, and here are the precapillary sphincters. So as blood flows into the shunt, if these precapillary sphincters are relaxed, will flow blood into all of these interweaving capillaries. These go past pretty much every individual cell in your body. will exchange oxygen, pick up carbon dioxide, deliver nutrients, pick up waste products, and this will come together into a venule, which will eventually get back to the heart. This is what a metabolically active tissue looks like. This is what a capillary bed in your calf muscle might look like if you're jogging. Now, at night, when you're asleep, your calf muscle is not very busy, so it doesn't need a lot of oxygen or nutrients. In this case, because the tissue is not very metabolic, these precapillary sphincters close down. We just let the blood go straight through the capillary bed. There'll be enough diffusion of materials into the surrounding tissue to keep all of the cells healthy, but we won't send blood into all of those little capillaries. Again, the blood will eventually get back to the heart. In the capillaries, diffusion is what causes the exchange between the blood and the tissues. Carbon dioxide and waste are very high in the tissue. Since diffusion goes along a concentration gradient, these substances will easily diffuse into the blood. The blood in the tissue will be high in oxygen and nutrients. Since the tissues will be low in these things, oxygen and nutrients will easily diffuse into the tissues. There are several different diffusion routes. Anything that is lipid soluble will simply diffuse through the cell membranes of the endothelial cells that make up the capillaries. Small molecules can diffuse through little spaces between these cells that make up the capillaries or little holes in the epithelial cells that make up the capillaries that are called fenestrations. And really large molecules will be picked up on one side of the epithelial cell carried across the cell and delivered to the other side. This is called vesicular transport. So as we look at our capillary, and a capillary has just that tunica intima, just a single layer of epithelial cells. Here is the basement membrane, so we just have to go through here. Diffusion can simply go right through the membranes. Anything that's lipid soluble will just diffuse right through the cell, either into the blood or into the tissue, either way. But these little spaces between the cells, these are called the intercellular clefts, act as little pores that will allow larger molecules that are water soluble to get through. And in some instances, the cells of the capillary have little holes in them called fenestrations. And that can be another avenue for small water-soluble molecules to get through. If it's a fairly large molecule that needs to move across, it will be picked up on one side of the endothelial membrane, transported across, and released on the other side or this could happen in the other direction just as well. Capillaries will vary in how leaky they are, how much material can get through. The capillaries of the digestive system are very absorptive. Those in the brain don't let too much stuff get through them. In addition to the general circulation of blood through the body, we have a few special circulations that ensure certain very special things happen. One special circulation is the circle of Willis. This is a circle of blood vessels at the base of the brain. It surrounds the pituitary gland. There are four blood vessels going to the brain that make this circle. This helps ensure that there's a good blood supply to the brain, even should one of those four major blood vessels get blocked somehow. The hepatic portal system is sort of a detour for the blood from the digestive system. 
Blood from the digestive system may be very nutrient rich if you've just eaten or may be nutrient poor if it's been a while since you've eaten. Your liver has the function of balancing those nutrients. So blood from the digestive system goes to the liver before it returns back to regular circulation so that the liver can either take nutrients out of nutrient rich blood and store them or go to their stores and put nutrients back into nutrient poor blood. This is what helps keep your blood sugar level the same all the time. And then we have fetal circulation. This is the blood flow between the fetus and the placenta. Here you see the circle of Willis. There are four blood vessels that feed into this, and this blood supply here will then feed all of the blood vessels that go to the brain. So even should, say, your carotid artery get blocked on one side, the brain will still get plenty of blood because the other three blood vessels will feed the circle of Willis, which feeds all of these blood vessels that go to the brain. Here is the hepatic portal system. Blood from the digestive organs is routed through the liver before it returns to the regular circulation. And this is so the liver can balance nutrients in the blood. Blood circulation in the fetus is different from blood circulation in a newborn. The fetal lungs and the digestive organs of the fetus are not functional. Nutrients and gases are exchanged through the placenta. The umbilical cord has three blood vessels in it. The umbilical vein is carrying nutrients and oxygen-rich blood to the fetus, and the umbilical arteries, and there are two of them, are carrying waste products away from the fetus to the placenta. The placenta will be the exchange organ for the fetus. Most of the blood from the umbilical vein travels directly to the right atrium of the heart in a blood vessel in the fetus known as the ductus venosus. Now normally blood going into the right atrium would go to the right ventricle and be pumped to the lungs. But we don't really need to send very much blood to the lungs because the lungs aren't functional. So a lot of the blood that enters the right atrium goes through a hole in the heart called the foramen ovale over to the left atrium. The left atrium will allow the blood to go to the left ventricle, to the aorta, to the body of the fetus. Some blood does get to the right ventricle and ends up in the pulmonary trunk. Most of the blood that gets into the pulmonary trunk is shunted to the aorta through a special little blood vessel called the ductus arteriosus. So as we look at the placenta, the one umbilical vein taking blood to the fetus, once it gets into the fetus, this is called the ductus venosus, it dumps the blood in the right atrium. A lot of the blood just goes over into the left atrium. Some blood that does go to the right ventricle and gets in the pulmonary trunk gets sent over to the aorta so that most of the blood ends up circulating through the fetus and then the two umbilical arteries carry the oxygen poor waste product rich blood back to the placenta for exchange. Once the baby is born it needs to go to a more normal circulatory system. The foramen ovale, that hole between the right and left atrium, will close up. It will leave behind a little bit of scar tissue that will be known as the fossa ovalis. The ductus arteriosus, that blood vessel between the aorta and the pulmonary trunk, will spasm down and become a ligament. It will be known as the ligamentum arteriosum. The ductus venosus and the umbilical arteries will also close off, and they will become ligaments that help support the liver and the urinary bladder. So as we look at the newborn, they have a more normal circulatory system. We close off the foramen ovale to make the fossa ovalis. We lose the ductus arteriosus and the ductus venosum and the umbilical arteries become these ligaments, again, that support the liver and the urinary bladder. There are two very easy ways to monitor circulatory efficiency. One is by taking a pulse and the other is by taking the blood pressure. The pulse is simply the expansion and recoil of an artery. It represents one heartbeat. There are various pressure points on the body. These are simply areas where an artery is close to the surface and can be palpated or felt. You will compress the artery against a firm tissue and you will feel the pulse as the blood goes through the blood vessel. Your common pressure points are the superficial temporal artery in the head and the facial artery. Both of these are a little challenging to find. The common carotid artery in the neck and the radial artery are probably the two most commonly used spots for finding a pulse. There is a pulse in the brachial artery in the bend of your arm. Right here where the leg joins the body, there's the femoral artery. Behind your knee is the popliteal artery. There is an artery right behind that knot on your ankle called the posterior tibial artery, and there is an artery across the top of your foot, the dorsalis pedis. All of these are places where a pulse can be palpated or felt. 
Taking the blood pressure is another way to monitor circulatory efficiency. Blood is going to flow along a pressure gradient. It's going to flow from higher pressure to lower pressure. Now the heart generates the blood flow. That is, it causes the blood to move through the blood vessels. The resistance to that flow is what results in the blood pressure. The closer you are to the pump, the higher the pressure. The further from the pump, the lower the pressure. So the arteries closest to the heart take most of the pressure. That's why they have such a thick tunica media and so much elastic tissue in them. As you get into the venous system, you have much less tunica media because there's much less pressure placed on those blood vessels. So the pressure is highest in the arteries and lowest in the veins. Since blood leaves the heart in the arteries, then goes into the capillary beds, and then gets into the veins, blood is flowing from the higher pressure of the arteries to the lower pressure of the veins. Peripheral resistance is simply the amount of friction encountered by blood in the blood vessels. There are basically two things that contribute to peripheral resistance. Peripheral resistance will increase when blood vessels are constricted. This is the chief way the body controls blood pressure. We can control the diameter of those blood vessels, and this is one of the ways we can control peripheral resistance and blood pressure. The second thing is blood volume or viscosity. If those increase, peripheral resistance will increase. Now, blood viscosity is pretty constant, as is blood volume, but there are situations where viscosity can increase or blood volume could decrease. Other factors that influence blood pressure are things like age, weight, time of day and body position, as well as exercise, emotions, and drugs. Hypotension is low blood pressure. Here the blood pressure is below 90 over 60 millimeters of mercury. Often low blood pressure is associated with long life. When you have a low blood pressure, you put very little stress on your blood vessels. This gives you a very low chance of cardiovascular disease. Hypotension is only a problem if it leads to inadequate flow of blood to the various tissues. Orthostatic hypotension is a temporary drop in blood pressure when someone goes from sitting to standing or from lying down to standing. Usually this is due to the aging sympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system should kick in whenever you suddenly stand up and constrict some blood vessels to help keep blood going to your brain. As you get older, the sympathetic nervous system gets a little slower at doing this and so you may get a little dizzy when you stand up. Chronic hypotension can be a sign of serious underlying disease. Things like Addison's disease, hypothyroidism, and severe malnutrition all lead to hypotension. Acute hypotension is when you've lost blood volume very suddenly. You have a sudden drop in your blood pressure and this can lead to circulatory shock and death. Hypertension is the other side of the coin. Hypertension is when you have a sustained systolic pressure above 140 or a sustained diastolic pressure above 90. Chronic hypertension is sometimes referred to as the silent killer. You have no signs that you have this until considerable damage has been done to the body. Prolonged hypertension leads to heart failure, vascular disease, renal failure, and stroke. Little tears in the endothelium that occur during times of hypertension accelerates plaque development. Primary hypertension is also known as essential hypertension. With this kind of hypertension, there is no identifiable underlying cause. We do know some things contribute to it. Primary hypertension does tend to run in families, so heredity plays a role. Diets high in salt, fat, and cholesterol, and low in things like calcium and magnesium, can also contribute to the development of primary hypertension. Obesity, age, diabetes mellitus, long-term stress, and smoking all also contribute to the development of this disease. About 90% of all hypertension is primary hypertension. Secondary hypertension is the other 10% of cases. Here we can find some cause of the hypertension. Obstructed renal arteries, kidney disease, endocrine disorders, things like that are causing the hypertension. It's secondary to some other disease. Once we fix the primary problem, say the kidney disease, then the hypertension goes away. Congenital heart defects are the most common of the congenital defects probably because the heart develops during the first trimester. Many times women go through a big chunk of that without even knowing they're pregnant and may do things that do damage to the fetus. Half of all congenital defects are heart defects. There are two basic kinds of congenital heart defects. One is when the mixing of oxygenated and unoxygenated blood continues after birth. 
This could be because the foramen ovale does not close, that would be a septal defect, or because the ductus arteriosus does not close. Patent simply means open, so a patent ductus arteriosus would mean that it is still open. This means that that circulation the fetus needed is now still in play when the newborn needs a different kind of circulation. The other major problem is narrowed valves or blood vessels. What this does is it doesn't allow blood to flow freely into the body. Coarctation of the aorta is a common congenital heart defect. Here the aorta is too small and so blood does not travel easily to the body. There is a very serious disease known as tetralogy of Fallot. Here you've got a mix of both problems. Varicose veins are caused by incompetent venous valves. The valves in the veins are supposed to prevent backflow. If they don't, then blood pools in the veins, the veins dilate and become curvy and torturous. Some of the contributing factors include heredity, this does tend to run in families, but anything that hinders venous return from the lower part of the body can also cause varicose veins. Blood returning to your heart from the lower part of the body needs some assistance. Part of the assistance comes from contracting skeletal muscle. So if you don't contract the skeletal muscles in your leg regularly, this causes blood to sort of stay in your legs. Prolonged standing where you're not moving those leg muscles very much can cause this to happen. Also, any kind of pressure on the groin vessels, the vessels that are coming from the leg into the body, can cause blood to pool in the legs. This happens during pregnancy. As the uterus gets larger, it puts some pressure on those veins, and people who are overweight have the same problem. Atherosclerosis is a degenerative disorder. That means it happens with aging. The arteries have a lot of elastic tissue in them, and all elastic tissue loses some of its bounds as we get older. The same is true of the elastic tissues in the arteries. This helps contribute to hypertension. One of the things that goes along with hypertension is being an older person. Coronary artery disease is when we have deposits on the coronary arterial walls. These deposits or plaques may be cholesterol or may be other substances. Because these plaque areas will not be smooth, platelets will tend to aggregate there, so this is a site for clots. Even if clots don't develop, the plaque will narrow the vessels, so any embolus that may be traveling through might lodge here and cause a myocardial infarction. 